Okay, so hello everybody and, and welcome to all of you to this special webinar. Uh, my name is Juan Camaño and I'm part of the security team of Pau Costa Foundation. And some of you might don't know what Pau Costa Foundation is and just a brief resume of what, who we are and what we do. So Pau Costa Foundation is a nonprofit organization that facilitates basically the encounter of between researchers, emergency services, and, and the civil society, okay? We focus mainly on prevention, fire ecology, and forest fire management, and major emergency, okay? With the aim of disseminating, disseminating knowledge and making projects that serve to forest fire community and society, basically, okay? If you want more information, we have, you can, just uh, get into our webpage and there's a lot of information on who we are and what are the projects that we are involved, basically. Okay, and this is a special webinar uh, because uh, with this webinar, we will close the mini webinar series that we started two months ago because of the pandemic situation that made us stay at home and we decided to, to promote knowledge of different uh, professionals in the wildfire community. And we decided to give the opportunity to the uh, professionals to use our platform to share their knowledge or experience or projects, okay? And it's a special because we have uh, with us Victor Stephenson uh, from Australia. And Victor, he's an Australian writer and filmmaker and musician and consultant applying traditional knowledge values in this contemporary world, okay, through workshops and artistic project. He is descended of the Tagalaga people through his mother connection. So Victor has Aboriginal heritage and much of, much of Victor's work over the past 27 years has been based on the arts and reviving traditional knowledge values. Uh, through mentoring and leadership, as well as on-ground training with Aboriginal communities and many non-Indigenous Australians. He's also the co-founder of the, of the National Indigenous Fire Workshop, which have so far been hosted in Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria. Victor has also connected with First Nation communities in California, uh, Canada, and Sami people in Scandinavia, sharing cultural knowledge practices related to caring for the country. So, mm, uh, Victor, this is all for you. This is your time. And thank you very much for being here with us. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Joan. And um, it's a pleasure to um, be a part of this and to present today um, for those listening um, in different parts of the globe. Um, over home, we here we um, always start our webinars with, with um, acknowledgement to country, and so I'd like to acknowledge um, our elders here in this country, and um, and also our landscapes here, but also all your homes and ancestors wherever you're from. I'd like to acknowledge all of that um, in respects um, before I begin. So um, yeah, so my name is Victor Stevenson. Yes, and um, and I've been working with Indigenous fire management for a long time now. Um, mainly started off with traditional knowledge recording uh, because back when I was say 18, I started to um, record knowledge with two special mentors of mine, elders, who I also like to acknowledge. And those, um, we started to see that how knowledge was, um, was needed to be recorded before it was lost. And it was across all the knowledge fields you know, from food or water, animals, plants, fire, um, ceremony, everything. And all of that knowledge is so crucial. And the Aboriginal knowledge system is so holistic that it connects everything. And this is a holistic knowledge system that's thousands of years old. And I dare say that um, other indigenous cultures around the world have a long history with the landscape and practices that, that also may have been lost and are still there today in some and fortunately for us in Australia, um, we do have a lot of knowledge and um, still left. And we do have a lot of communities that have a lot of land um, that they're living on and, and manage their lands as Aboriginal lands. But also now um, with a strong movement in Australia with the firework, 
it's moving towards um, um, a strong influence now and burning across all, um, all tenures and involving all agencies in a whole learning curve in, in creating change and new directions, um, acknowledging landscapes and old knowledge systems and peoples and um, such as Aboriginal knowledge. Um, for us here, getting started in Australia was really hard, you know. It was like starting off like many other communities and around the world are probably at, where we're struggling to be heard and Aboriginal people are struggling to get their aspirations on the table and Indigenous peoples are struggling to um, apply their knowledge on country um, and have a go in demonstrating the values into the landscape. And that was something that I seen as an urgency um, with many um, people in this country here in Australia. And so we started to work um, towards that goal and demonstrating that knowledge. And for Indigenous knowledge systems, the only way that it can be um, um, showed to people and, um, and made aware to the broader population is through demonstration. And that is how it is um, passed down. That is how it is um, shown to people and proven um, in how it works. It's, it's never written down too much, you know, it's mainly through practical application and that's the way it's been passed on for thousands of years. So all the work to date for myself over the last 27 years um, has always been based on the practical application. And that's the only way that it can be demonstrated and shared. So with the problems within our landscapes and when, when we see people taken out of landscapes, because Aboriginal people have been a part of the landscape for thousands of years and people have been part of landscapes for a long time and, and the landscapes um, are being shaped by people. And in Australia, there's no, um, it's no surprise that Aboriginal people have shaped this landscape over thousands of years. And the landscape um, um, needs the people to continue those practices in some places. Now we have landscape that doesn't belong to fire. And we have landscapes that do belong to fire. And those landscapes that don't belong to fire, we leave them alone from fire, you know, and they look after themselves in the sense of that. And that is places like rain, like rainforests, um, certain rainforests and um, river systems and uh, other different ecosystems that we um, also um, don't burn for specific reasons. But there's a lot of country that we also do apply fire to. And that is what we call the fire prone country and that needs fire. And it's a very sophisticated and complex knowledge because it's based on reading the landscape. It's not just about lighting the match. And when people apply the fire, it's a benefit to the country. So when we look at Aboriginal fire knowledge, it's, it's based on three, mo three main principles. And the first principle is that it's based on cultural spirituality and connection to landscapes. And when we apply uh, fire to country and it's good for country and it benefits the landscape, it becomes embedded in stories and it comes embedded in song and spiritual connection to landscapes which forms culture over a long time and which connects us to everything on, on the country. And that's a, a interconnected holistic uh, relationship with Mother Earth. And that um, is so important. And the indicators today um, are there that actually show that and support that. So when we light fires in our country and we, we light it to protect the trees and protect the canopies and as you can see the fire behind me, you know, there's small fires that just look after the country and keep the landscape clean and, and, and healthy. And so that practice of applying fire is, 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 so, is so important for the people, for every part of their culture, from food and right through in their spiritual sense. So the other important factor for burning is to look after the ecology and to burn for the animals and plants and, and to look after the country and to enhance the health of that landscape. Because you've got to understand that people depended on the country for food and they, uh, it, the whole landscape was their life and property and was their home. Not just a, a building that we live in today or a house and then we go down to the supermarket and that's just about as much as a world that most people see. But people are on the land constantly and looking after it because of the values that it had and the importance of its resources and 
also the importance of not to lose those resources, which comes to the point of the third and most important principle is to prevent the wildfires and to look after our, our natural resources by managing the landscape. So protecting life and property as all, was also important because the people didn't want massive bushfires and burning down their country um, to lose all their resource and food. So it was very um, an intimate um, connection to landscape and it's, it's not just about fire, it's about everything. And when we look in our modern day sense, where we are today and what um, the Western societies have done to landscapes around, right around the world is, um, you know, cut the trees down, open the land up, land clearing and, um, you know, disrespecting our river systems and water and taking the water and sucking it all up into big corporates and all of these, this, these actions of the landscape has made our country more prone to fire even more and even more open to um, large bushfires and challenging times. But it doesn't matter what happens to country and it doesn't matter where we are in this point in time. It always boils back to the, um, that the law of the landscape never changes. And what we're finding from our experiences here in Australia with um, all the work that we're doing is that the indigenous knowledge system is vital to solutions and understanding um, how we look after our country and how we, in the long term, hope to prevent the wildfires, but in the short term, um, to enhance the health of landscapes and, and to see the social benefits as well that goes within the community. Now, when you look at Western uh, methods of burning like hazard reduction, and there is a prominent question that has always been said, and that is, uh, what's the difference between hazard reduction and, and Aboriginal burning and fire management? Um, and there's a stark difference. And just alone, when I, what I've told you about, um, all those different values that come from the fire and all those connections that come from the fire and also the techniques in applying fire in a modern sense when landscapes are sick and unbalanced and how we are in a phase in this world at the moment of healing and not just healing the country, but healing ourselves and our communities because it's fractured right across the board. So the, the applying this fire is layers and layers of benefits. And it's not just based on reducing fuel and looking after life and property. There's so much more than that. And if we just look at life and property and, just, uh, and, and hazard reduction and we just focus, that's all it is. And that's all it's ever going to be. And that's gonna, that, that has been our, in the, you know, like, that's been the view for Western fire management in, the, in this country for a while now. And it hasn't worked. And the benefits are not there, are right across the board, and the values aren't there that feed into um, all the um, areas that Indigenous knowledge does and the connection to landscapes in a more intimate way do. And for us here, it's, it's, it's already showing huge um, benefits in healing community, education. You know, this country was deprived of thousands of years of knowledge. And now it's finally been shared in a way that has been practical. And it's amazing um, the benefits and um, the outcomes that have come from that. Um, we have um, a young people that are more motivated and healing from our social problems. And I'm not saying all our social problems, but there's opportunities around employment. There's a better relationships between um, indigenous cultures and the broader community and agencies and government. Um, there's been quite a, a lot of work and quite a shift done to um, really create a lot of awareness around, hey, we need to create change and we need to start looking at the world differently. And we need to start being practical about it so that it can be demonstrated. And that's what exactly what we've done over the years with the work here by doing public workshops and so forth. And it's been um, a lot of hard work. Um, and we've started off with people, it was just Aboriginal people doing the workshops and, and then, um, you know, down the track, people started to see what was going on and they started to experience those workshops. And then we had pastoralists and farmers and, you know, um, researchers and government workers and firefighters and uh, national parks and all sorts of, um, just general private land, landowners 
all interested in um, understanding the landscape a little bit more from an indigenous perspective and experiencing the fire on country. It's such an important thing and I can't stress enough how important it is that we are going back a step to move forward together um, in reviving knowledge from country. And the most exciting thing for me, working with communities in, uh, in Canada and other parts um, that I have had experience with, is the sharing of that knowledge and the similarities of knowledge and the ability to bridge principles um, through the landscapes. Um, so for example, when I went to the Canada to work with um, uh, the people there, I didn't know anything about the trees. It was a totally foreign country to me. But then they started to teach me the trees as the first step. And so they were saying, oh, I said, well, what's that tree and what's that tree? And then they started to say, well, this is the tree and what are the values of that? And I said, well, what do you use it for? Is there any medicine? So they told me all they knew about each tree and from what they could tell me and um, based on their cultural knowledge of that tree. And through those links and, and those bits of information, it started to link up with trees that were similar to their trees. Oh, we had a tree too that had lots of berries and sandy soils and, and it's just like the tree you have. And so I was able to say, well, that tree is just like our bloodwood tree. And it's with the same soil as our bloodwood tree country. And the grasses are also the same size. And look, they're starting to cure just like our, our um, grass in a similar time frame. And when we looked at the other trees, um, I could see that the grasses were different and the soils were different. And as each tree changed, the soil changed, just like here at home. And then I found another tree that was our ironbark tree here in Australia that lived in the higher parts of the mountains and had the rockier soils. And even after the wildfire passed through that country, um, that same rocky country, um, the same effects the fire had to the soils were exactly the same as our ironbark country here in Australia. So there's, I was jumping around in excitement. I was like, wow, you know, this is incredible. And the people were like looking at me going, why are you so excited? And then I looked at, I told them why. I said, well, this is like an ironbark country and look exactly the same indicators as, a, as your, your country in the same place where it grows. And, and, um, and I believe that um, that bridging knowledge um, and supporting each other with indicates landscapes can help rebuild knowledge and rebuild understanding and landscapes and help cultures that have lost that knowledge um, and um, on their country um, over say hundreds of hundreds of years of not being connected to that cultural knowledge and um, can actually be revived in some ways through landscapes and indigenous people sharing knowledge. And through that, um, we're able to fast track a lot of information um, through those indicators and landscapes and knowledge. And when we looked at one tree species and I looked at it and I said, oh, that's just like a, another one of our areas. And, and I looked at the grass and then I said, oh, look, that's all cured now, it's ready to go. And all the other trees and other ecosystems I was looking at, I could see that the grasses weren't dry, they were green. So for us, each different ecosystem cures at different timing and you can read the landscape and know when to burn the right ecosystems at the right time. And I said to them, I think this one's ready to go now. And they looked and said, that's impossible. It's cold. It's too cold. Look at the snow and there's snow in the mountains. And I said, well, it's telling me that it will burn. And it will only burn this ecosystem and go out when it gets to the next tree. And so I asked them to give me the match and I lit it, the grass. And it burnt perfectly, it burned all around, just exactly the way it should burn, just taking away all the dead grass and not harming the trees and not harming even a lot of the berry plants that were there and plants that provide food for animals. And that fire burnt exactly that ecosystem. And I was just like, there you go. It's exactly like home. And they were just amazed. And that was it. Excitement hit the roof. And the other thing that, that supports that is language and stories. And so as the elders were starting to see that, they were like, oh, you know, um, there's a word that we have that, um, that um, sort of fits in with what we're seeing in these indicators that we don't really use because it's a word that 
um, we don't really understand because it's based on those practical applications of landscapes that we don't apply anymore or parts of culture that we don't um, usually um, practice that much now. And so language started to come alive and um, memory started to be reactivated. And when we have stories and language and we have country and we have apply the practical application and the fires do exactly what we say it went out exactly where we said it went out it didn't burn what we said it wouldn't burn and all the grasses reshooted and berries reshooted that hadn't been there for a while or all these indicators and that matches up with stories and it matches with language we start to um, rebuild knowledge from landscapes and not all knowledge but a lot of knowledge that's quite practical and important that has been learned from country. Because when you look at it, the land is the boss. The country is, tells us what to do. And whenever we make a decision, we read the landscape. But when we look at the Western methods, they make their decisions from maps and they make their decisions through time frames, um, through roads. Um, it's not based on reading the landscape and what it needs and when to burn and, and understanding the land telling you when to apply that fire. And um, that is where we need to be in the sense of understanding our landscapes a lot more. And when we get to that point of understanding landscapes that deeply, then all there's more doors that open. And so we're finding here with the programs that, you know, we have education um, interests to get into schools and, um, we have teachers that are interested in this knowledge and how they can share that with the children. And we have, um, you know, um, people in the community that want to record data and do monitoring and science. And we have a, a range of people who want to be fire practitioners and look after the country. And um, there's also benefits with using the resources. So once we make country healthy and we get country looking healthy with our diversity and plants, then that opens opportunity for economical uh, opportunities too that are yet to be explored if, as we move along with this um, healing stages. And the other thing that's important too is the weeds and how we utilize those and harvest those. And the harvesting of landscape through indigenous knowledge is such an important land management tool as well that has not even hardly even been tapped into. And when we make land healthy, we start to explore those opportunities as well um, that come with the fire. So is, has a reduction different to Aboriginal burning? Yes, it's a, a quite a lot, but it's not a war against hazard reduction and an Aboriginal fire. Um, that's not the way that it works. Oh, sorry. That was my little boy that burst through the door and wasn't aware. Um, so, yeah. And so there's a lot of, there's, it's not about a war about hazard reduction and, and, um, and Aboriginal knowledge. It's, it's really um, not about, uh, oh, this is Aboriginal people taking over, or this is about white fathers. This is not about a separation in our society. This is about um, digging down to the common sense of um, taking advantage and, and, and reviving and understanding that indigenous knowledge is a great, is an important platform to work from in, um, for solutions into the future. And it is in a really um, important way of fast tracking solutions. And if indigenous people have the capacity um, and the opportunities to share knowledge and to demonstrate this in different places, um, then we're gonna see um, a lot of opportunities and a lot of um, um, key um, knowledge indicators and bits and pieces that's gonna help us and it's crucial for our future of this planet. And we're not going to get that if we're continuing down the same mind frame of Western um, ways of seeing the land or the modern ways of seeing the land of just seeing it as life and property has a reduction and a war against our um, mother nature and the earth. So it can't sort of work that way. Um, we need to look at change. And with all the bushfires and that are happening and especially for us in Australia, the last ones that we've had here, have been a big wakening call. And this nation was shaken by the last fires here. And Mother Nature has been shouting out for a long time. There's been wildfires here most years in this country and that has hit the news and has, you know, killed people and, and taken out houses. And 
and this time it was even bigger. And I even see other parts of the world where fires are starting to happen where they've never really seen them before. And it's all about adapt, adaptation. And, you know, we can't be looking at it as doom and gloom. We need to be looking at as an opportunity that the land is telling us that we need to adapt, and we need to change. Because when it comes to climate change, um, Aboriginal people have been adapting to climate for thousands of years. And I'm sure that there would have been times thousands of years ago when Aboriginal people um, didn't burn as much and other times when they'd burn a little bit more, a little bit less. But we've come to a point now where um, we're burning um, really badly because the way we've been treating the planet and the health of the landscapes, but also um, our relationship with the landscape is really being disconnected and um, uh, for a long time now. So reconnecting is important. And it's not just about, you know, the environmental management side of things. It's also about our social structures as well. Um, and it's about getting people to work together. Because we can't have one agency running off and, in, in, um, in, you know, into the distance and leaving, leaving everyone else behind and Aboriginal people wanting to manage and not involve anyone or whatever. People have to work together. And we seem to be here in Australia, we've, we've headed down the track where we have a lot of um, unbalanced relationships within our society where we have different mind frames and mindsets and how they see the world that um, is not really based on practical applications, but is based, based on opinions. And that doesn't work. And it hasn't worked for us here. And what we're finding from those wildfires and what we're finding from the constant work of cold, um, indigenous fire management on the country is that people are starting to see um, that there is a way forward um, and there is a value in indigenous knowledge systems and it can be shared and people can work together and must work together. Otherwise, we're not going to solve these problems. So the programs that we are doing are involving, um, you know, everyone and driven by um, the place and people and respect of place and people. And I believe that um, those values can be shared um, abroad. And if we can demonstrate that in, in other places and we can share that with other cultures and, um, and if we can get ourselves um, down the track, even in our own country to demonstrate this more strongly, then there's a really great opportunity um, to steer some hope into the future for our, the, you know, the future generations um, right across the board. Um, because it really is about a turning point. And this is our turning point. And I'd like to see our generation as a turning point um, to create change and to look at change um, in a way that we need to um, make it happen now. Because when we look at the short-term successes, we'll be able to celebrate those. We'll be able to celebrate you know, programs starting, seeing country improve, um, seeing education and schools and kids get more interested. We'll be able to celebrate people working together. Um, and also, most importantly, we'll be able to celebrate um, evolving culture and, um, and seeing knowledge and culture um, continue to thrive and enrich itself um, to a greater intelligence for mankind rather than a separation and um, disconnectedness of landscapes that seem to put us down the road of, um, you know, uh, so many challenges and environmental challenges and climate change and so forth. So we need to be looking at hope. And when we see all the children and everyone scared of fire and scared of all the changes that are happening and fear for climate change, that's not what we want everyone to feel. We want them to feel like, hey, this is an opportunity for us to change. And I think people are understanding that. Um, especially with the COVID going on. I mean, look at, it's terrible what's happened there and all those people have been suffering, but it's taught us something as well. You know, it's, it's taught us that um, we can improve the landscapes if we change. And with improving the air qualities and improving the carbon that's in the atmosphere and improving the quality of our water, waterways in some places. It's, it's a fascinating, indicator of mother nature talking to us and telling us that we can do it and i believe that we can do it because people have done it for a long time and have done it before and um and and i just hope that um that 
you know, the positives become stronger than the negatives with the challenges that face um, before us. So the fire is just the beginning for us. And it's just the first door to open um, many doors. And it's never just about the fire. And for me, it's been about communicating that strongly as possible to the broader in, in Australia here. And, that, you know, we need to get our own backyard cleaned up here. And we need to get it working um, properly and we need to get programs going. And the expectations around that is going to be um, quite long expectations. And, you know, and people need to be aware of those expectations that it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take time and patience to rebuild the practitioners and to strengthen the knowledge and to, um, you know, get the resources and the support and to get everyone supporting each other and to look at the long-term um, successes in our landscapes and, um, and indicators that show us we're on the right track. You know, that we have a, a 500, where 500 year old trees used to be and there's no more there that there will be a 500 year old tree in 500 years time. If we start to look at working towards that goal for our future generation. Um, and it's going to be the small indicators of success that will pave the way um, for those long term into the future. And I think this is an important step for, for everyone. And the most important thing for Western um, mindsets or for um, disconnected mindsets or whatever you want to call it, um, is to know that this is for everyone. And this is something that we we need to engage in and give it a go and we need to respect um, this knowledge system and give it the opportunity to um, to show its values and how that's going to help us because uh, we need we need everything that um, possible um, to be able to um, pull those values out and to show how they're a benefit for us all but if we don't start the ball rolling and if we don't start um, looking at programs that we have never done before um, in this modern world and we have and we don't start putting our shoulders behind what's working together and sharing those successes then um, we're never going to be the turning point because I really believe we need to work together because this is a big world and a big country here in Australia and not one person can or group um, could do it on their own because the problems are huge and when we see landscapes that have changed and there's um, like sicknesses in our landscape is introduce grasses now and introduce weeds and we have invasive natives that come out of the country um, when we see wildfires and uh, we've, we're, and we've got less trees and opened up country and drier rivers um, that's all uh, on the card to start healing it and improving that in order for us to get um, on top of the fire problems in the country and that's going to take a long time because it's taken a long time for that for them to destroy a country and to where it is now it'll take even longer for us to to get on the road of a more positive track to heal landscapes so important for us in that sense and um when we look at the indigenous knowledge system it it will never change and the law of the landscape will never change and when we apply that fire to the right country and we start healing landscapes, um, it changes our patterns and we can adjust our fire patterns. So for example, the, the fire you're seeing behind me and this country that we have here behind me is um, we burned it twice within the same season. And the reason we did that because it was unbalanced and it had different grasses. And so we'll, um, we adjust our burning patterns to burn only certain the native grasses that were cured first to allow it to, at the right time to kill the introduced grasses. And we came back and we burnt the introduced grasses. And sometimes there's three burns that we do in one place and that takes more time. And each place that is sick, it's like a doctor. You gotta say, well, this place is say, for example, this country that burned at this time of year and it's really sick and we can't burn it at the right time because there's the wrong type of vegetation. So the heat will be too hot for the soil and it won't favor our native seeds. And so we burn a little off and burn it twice or three times and strategize um, burning country correctly so that it um, creates the right temperatures to promote the right vegetation. 
the right vegetation for property is a major goal to having the right fires for the landscape um, and less in higher intensity fires when we see vegetation that doesn't belong into those soils or specific ecosystems. So for us here, we burn for the right vegetation. And that is where the indigenous knowledge comes in and understanding the soils, the trees, the timing, and um, that baseline knowledge that has come from the landscape and that has been learned from the landscape. And that gives us the baseline to adjust our burns to heal country. There's so much. Victor. Yeah, Victor, we have a lot of questions. So uh, I think it was great to know your experience, but I, I think it would be great if we can start um, sending you some of the questions of the participants because it will give a lot of debate for sure. Okay, a lot of debate. Okay, so if you don't mind, let's start a little bit with some of the questions. The first, it comes from Paul Costa or from myself um, somehow. So you said during your presentation, you said a couple of times or the, the word reconnect. Okay, you said it quite often during your presentation. I, I completely agree. I think while we, our society has evolved in the last century, we have disconnected ourselves from the landscape for sure. Okay, becoming more citizens. Okay, the word citizens comes from the city and that has a lot of meaning behind it. Okay, there's a lot of meaning. That's disconnect from the landscape to live on a city, an artificial landscape. Okay, and obviously here in Spain or in Spain or in Europe, we still have some ancest ancestral knowledge of fire management with the European shepherds here in, in North of Spain, we still have shepherds and cowboys that burns in a quiet period of time just to grow grass for the cattle, for the ships. And also in other parts of America, as you, as you know. So for me, one of the key questions for you will be, how can we articulate tools to protect this knowledge, this ancestral knowledge, which will last over the time and be able to expand it to the future generations of fire practitioners. What are the tools that you use to, to keep that knowledge safe and distributed? Well, the most important tool is people. And when we look at how knowledge was transferred before, it was through people, handing down to people. And, you know, basically if you got to look at the timeline of, 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 of knowledge of the knowledge and how we've lost knowledge and when we look at before the elders that mentored me and elders before that they were walking libraries they were encyclopedias they knew the land so well and and um and that's how i learned from them and and they can make all the decisions from reading landscapes and then they were taken from country and taken off the landscapes and then we started to lose that knowledge and intelligence and and um and instantly loss of knowledge started to occur and the knowledge gap began where we had a gap in our knowledge system. And before that, and during that time, um, through the first hundred years in Australia or more, um, the um, non-Indigenous people also um, learned a lot from Aboriginal people and created a historical knowledge of fire and of this landscape um, that uh, they learned from people and they, they were able to manage landscapes just like um, your story there in Spain with uh, how people used to burn for the cattle or burn for grasses and improve livelihoods and pastures and so forth. But then over time, that historical knowledge that non-Indigenous people hadn't learned from Aboriginal people, um, once the conservation came along, um, you know, 50 years or more ago and started to create national parks and then suppress fire from the landscape altogether. Um, and even historical people of knowledge, elders, old white fellows couldn't share that knowledge. And so then I ended up with 40 year old farmers and young, young farmers come to me and say, well, I remember my grandfather burning, but I don't, um, I was too young to learn and he never continued to burn because he wasn't allowed. And then 50 years later, those old farmers passed away and the knowledge gap grew and we kept losing knowledge. And now we're in a position where people don't even understand the land. They don't even know if fire belongs in the land or not. They don't understand um, the complexity of knowledge that people were so intelligent right back then, and yet we're seen as prehistoric. And now people 
have no idea of the landscape. And so we've become dumber when it comes to um, our environmental connection to country and our connection to the world. Well, yes, we've gotten smarter in technology and all that sort of business, but what good is that if um, we haven't got no healthy country to live on? So we've become um, less intelligent when it comes to understanding our landscapes. And that is the knowledge gap that continues to grow. And so now they need a wind gauge and they stick thermometers in the soil and they're trying to use technology to tell them when to burn. And you can't rely on that. You, you know, you need, we need the knowledge into people. And that's why it's important for us that we create the training and the programs. And it's important from a cultural sense that it's something that people want to learn because it's a part of their culture and it's a part of their life, not just a part of their job um, and what they do for bread, for money. It is a part of their blood and their connection to their country. And so there is a greater um, need to um, connect with landscapes and to learn and, 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 a, and a hunger for a lot of our young people. And so installing that back into our people, into the people and managing landscapes that way and, and um, through these programs and reviving knowledge and put it into schools and educating our communities is putting that knowledge back into people and putting that awareness back into them as well. And even old, the old, old Joe blow down the road there that just doesn't like smoke in his curtains because he hate, he rings up the fire is fireies and calls triple zero all the time when he sees smoke because he wants to stop the fires because he's getting smoke in his house and spoiling his, his, um, you know, his living room. <laughs> and if he was just aware that why that fire was burning and the importance of that and how it's going to benefit that isn't, his house isn't going to burn down and then a couple of more months time or he's not going to face wildfires or, if they just were aware and understood, then everyone can play a part. And even people in cities, um, you know, there's a huge response here in Australia of all people in cities that are so interested in this knowledge and just to understand. Um, and they feel connected even in cities when they know that the landscape is, 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 is you know, being looked after and there's a chance for them to experience that. Um, and they can contribute just by simply being aware and knowing and educating other people and sharing the stories and, um, you know, and how that evolves into art and into songs and into dances and so many other ways to express it that um, you can do in, um, if you're not even living on country. Uh, this, so. Victor, this, this links me to the first question that was sent by Carmen Rodriguez that asked, mm -hmm. are there any or have you had any resistance from Aboriginal people in Australia to share that knowledge that it was, it was given to you or it was shared to you by the elders, uh, maybe due to lack of trust, for example, if there was any resistance from them? No, this, this is not about me and not about me teaching or knowledge given to me. This is about all of us. So it's a collective. And that's demonstrated through the massive network of communities that are mentoring each other and supporting each other in this country. And um, so the answer for that question is no, I've never had any direct uh, resistance. And all the families um, in my experience are all supportive and we do things the right way by protocol and we acknowledge the knowledge source, we acknowledge our elders um, and they are in the forefront um, of all this work and the pioneers of all this work. And the way that we share knowledge is not going into someone's country and going, well, this is how you burn. It's like how I explain and sharing knowledge and learning from each other and yeah. helping people to rebuild their own knowledge on their own country and putting in programs that they can tailor regionally for their own place and they can uh, make it work for themselves. And so we're trying to get, we're trying to implement programs now, our first pilot programs of regional programs where communities can, um, structure their own training courses based on the, the bones of what has been created with other communities. And so we're running on a principle here that is called community mentorship, where the peers of community mentoring community and supporting community. And that's why the programs are based on teaching the young people, um, creating more practitioners and through their experiences, um, getting them to share that with other communities and teach each other and share with each other. And that is what we call a knowledge sharing. And that knowledge sharing is based on shared knowledge principles. And shared knowledge is a level of knowledge that 
is not sacred knowledge. So there's two levels. You know, you have your sacred knowledge that we don't want to share, and that is language and you know, like stories and medicines and special medicines and all spirits or spiritual stuff. That's stuff that is that is um, you know you know sentimental or sacred for people. What we're based on where the fire realm sits um, on the basic level is in shared knowledge realm. And that is based on managing landscapes and look after your country. Otherwise you're going to get a wildfire. You're married. Um, my daughter's married to your son and your clan group. And you know, I want to see her have a happy life. And so I want to help you look after your country and help you so that you've got plentiful food and, and you need plentiful resources to be able to trade and to share. It's like me saying, brush your teeth, otherwise your teeth will fall out. You know, that is basic shared knowledge that is based on our, our, our well-being and is based, our baseline to um, keep us healthy and to keep us um, connected and to keep us a part of the landscapes. And, and that shared knowledge is, is more powerful than sacred knowledge because it holds um, our well-being and the health of our landscapes and our so, okay. Um, yeah, very important. Yeah. Okay. There's another question from Sebastian. Um, how would you explain? How do you explain to the Aboriginal people, who were not that much, and were applying a small fires, uh, or small burns, cultural burns, that succeed in managing the land? While today, we burn hundreds or thousands of hectares with prescribed burns, and we don't succeed on reducing the risk of having a big wildfire. How would you explain that? Yeah. Well, it's the way that we explain it and um, is, is that um, in Western management, they look at very small windows of burning. And a lot of them believe that it's based on the weather patterns and that, and yeah, it is based on weather patterns and windows can, can get smaller sometimes. And um, we, if there's drought, but um, at the end of the day, um, um, we've been burning when it's been drought just to protect country. Um, you know, we, the way that indigenous burning is done is through different seasons throughout the whole year. And certain country won't burn when this country burns. And, and so we're out there burning constantly and, and not burning a big quota of land in one small window. And when you're burning a large quota of land in one small window, you're actually putting in a lot of fire and you're burning a lot of the Western techniques of burning country when the whole landscape is dry and they haven't put any burns in and the whole place is completely dry grass. Um, there's no breaks in the country. There's no previous burns in the right landscapes to, um, to make country um, green grass. Like today I was burning up just today out bush. So I was burning and the fires went out where we burned last year. And so, that was because we burned the right temperatures, right time to improve the health of the country. Now, when you burn the country in a quota in a small window and you burn the country when it's all completely dry and you haven't done any other windows of burning, then you put hot fires in. And what happens is you burn the canopies and the trees and a lot of the hazard reduction fires can, can burn and do a lot more destruction. And when they haven't burned frequently and they burn less frequently, then there's a lot more fuel in the country. So they burn everything. And when you burn everything, then you create more fuel straight after the fire. The leaves of the trees are singed, they fall to the ground. And, and, um, and then in the hazard, even if you burn in winter and then the wildfires come in the summer, they still burn over their burns because they've burned all the leaves and they've created more fuel. And it just shows that when we do our cultural burns, um, those recent wildfires, they weren't out at our fires even even in that intense fire, we st none of our sites were burnt um, simply because the ground and the trees were still green and we didn't put fires in to create more fuel. We actually put fires in to take out all the old fuel and to enhance greenness in the landscape. And, you know, there's so many different avenues and, yeah. and that why. And, 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 you know, there's not just, you can't just put the sign up and say, oh, you can't, you know, hazard ocean is, is no different. Or you can't say, um, you know, that um, you, you can't stop the wildfires now because we saw fires go straight over hazard reduction burn. Um, but they haven't tried and understand that there are other, um, there's so much more um, information and knowledge. And 
you know, the country that you're seeing behind was behind me was burning when in the wet season time. And that's a time of year where no one burns here. And it's a crucial time that we call storm burn, that we burn certain country that needs water. And that's the Ambar country and other different types of country that have stony ground that we need water. And so we burn in windows. I've been burning in windows this year that, um, and I continue to burn for, I've always been burning in windows that um, a lot of authorities aren't even aware of. And um, they laugh at me when they get the permit. It's all green. We just had masses of rain. The rivers are flooding. Well, yeah, yeah you're not going to burn anything. And then the next minute they see smoke and large amounts of country um, that is burning in the higher areas and different places. And so there are windows um, that aren't being utilized and, there, and people aren't reading the landscape to burn to um, look after the trees. They're not taking in all the accounts that's needed to minimize the fire risks on a natural level of um, where um, the ecosystems and landscapes are actually resilient to fire if you look after them properly. They have an immune system, they have a health, and they have a different curing in grasses and they suck moisture differently. There's a whole lot of range of factors that, um, that make our la um, landscapes resilient, resilient at certain times of year to create fire breaks, natural fire breaks, um, and also to create healthy landscapes to um, deal with hotter fires later in the season and to prevent the spread of wildfires. And, you know, I'm not saying that it's all rosy and it's easy, and I'm not saying that all the answers are there, but there's a lot of common sense in that, and yeah. there's a lot of reasons um, why Aboriginal people had that complexity in understanding fire um, right across the board. To maintain diversity and to maintain the health of the country to... to um, to improve its resilience. Yeah. So there's another question from Elizabeth. Well, there, there's many questions. Let's see if we can get us through all of them. So Elizabeth is asking, as the gatherers, were women traditionally active in burning practice? Yeah, well, different communities have different protocols in different ways. And some places women burn. In some places they say women didn't burn. Um, I've seen women burning in ecosystems that um, provide a lot of um, food and, and yams and it's a place with a very sandy soils and they will burn in those areas to improve um, the harvesting of different plants. And a lot of men, the way I was taught for burning up uh, um, for my mentors was um, men were out burning um, large areas of grasslands um, in many places. Um, to improve the um, um, the grass pastures for kangaroos and other game that came in to eat the grasses, just like you're more burning for the the animals, yeah. and that was the hunting grounds and create hunting grounds. There's each ecosystem has different values and have different soils and um, different plants that have different values and and purposes that also filter to different people in general uh, that burn country, um, and so sometimes it's the country itself that determines who burns based on human values and also it's just, um, in some places it's based on sacred knowledge or um, traditions um, on who burns country and it's all different everywhere you go and not all the same in one place yeah okay so another question from kathleen uh, you mentioned victor fires in place uh, and countries that did not use to burn before okay mm -hmm. and I'm based in, in the Northwest Europe, I guess, and there is so much uh, we have to learn here about living with fire. What do you think we learn from indigenous fire management here and how can we establish this mutual learning and collaboration? Well, a friend of mine from the Snow Change um, in Finland um, sent me an article, um, Siberia burning, and um, People, you know, have you know a lot of those places, and, you know, not used to a lot of the fires and seeing change happening from climate change and things like that. And you know, all those, you know, for me to answer that question, there needs to be more work done. But um, from where I'm standing and, and what I'm hearing, um, it all boils back to um, the exchange of knowledge and sharing of knowledge um, that help improve our adaptation to landscapes and adaptation to change. Um, in our country and um, it would be just amazing to um, get 
um, the practitioners over to those countries that are experiencing these fires for the first time and to um, this, I can't express how important that process is to start um, looking at how um, they can start adjusting and adapting by applying fire. Um, and, um, you know, humans have gone through change for thousands of years and here we are um, seeing change before our very eyes and we can't just stand there and go, well, climate change, we can't do anything about it. Um, you know, the land has secrets and there are indicators in there um, to help us to find solutions. Mother nature is an incredible thing. And, um, and once again, it's that knowledge system that, uh, and that way of seeing the country and the, give the capacity um, to get the right people and, and practitioners to get over and to examine and share. And I just hope that happens immediately and that we start to see these programs um, and these opportunities happen to help people to start adjusting. I mean, you know, change is here and climate is changing. And I don't see anything like when I hear about the new, uh, countries that have fires for the first time, then um, it only um, means even more that we need to look at country and we need to look at um, principles from other countries that are similar landscapes to them and have similar um, um, sort of temperatures or, or some similarities that we can draw from and help to try and find solutions. And that's the ability of Aboriginal knowledge is, has an ability to fast track solutions if we um, give it its right capacity and, and, and way forward. So um, I think you know, it could be possible. And I, I just hope that um, no more time's wasted that, um, that these solutions are looked for, you know, and thought. So uh, we have, uh... A lot more questions so let's go for two more and uh, we need to close this webinar but just to let know to the participants we will uh, send these questions to Victor and he will answer them through an email and we will send it back to the to the participants if you're okay because we don't have much time I would like to close it by 1 p.m. here in Spain uh, it will be 9 for you there in Australia uh, so let's go for the next question. Two more and we have to close. I'm really sorry for that. Uh, one from Cristina Montiel and it says, how to recover connections to the landscape and reintroducing fire culture where Aboriginal people were killed and disposed and Aboriginal communities don't exist any longer in the country? Yeah, well, that's been a lot, some of the challenges for some communities in Australia where a lot of Aboriginal people now um, are no longer full blood or uh, they've lost a lot of their knowledge and lost a lot of elders and connection. And, um, and it's once again, the answer is through landscapes. Um, people might have lost a lot of connection on country, but they've still been living on their landscapes. And what we have is, is something that's called cultural memory. And cultural memory is basically our ancestral connection to country. And when bells are, are ring, people seem to, to get it and they seem to be able to, their knowledge of country goes from here to here um, in an instant when they sh get shown a few indicators of knowledge in landscapes. And that's, once again, it boils, it boils down to the power of the country and how important the country is when we um, allow it to be, uh, lead our um, programs and lead the way that we do this, these types of um, so for a lot of communities that I've worked with that have been disconnected and, you know, living on the streets, young fellows that were just in hip hop artists and just living in the streets around Sydney and, um, and um, cities and now a total outlook and different outlook on life because they've had that experience with country. And so once again, this boils down to healing people with country and healing people with country is um, such an important area. And when we look at fire and managing fire on country and applying fire on country, it's a healing process for people. And it's a revival of knowledge for people. It's a reconnection for people. And it's an opportunity um, that changes them. And it's an experience that they have. And that experience is, is um, there's, there's so many examples of that. Um, yeah, yeah. 
And you can check, like before I end, there's a lot, a lot of those stories you could see and there's a lot of chapters that I wrote on about these, a lot of these questions. And I've just, on this one here, this is Fire Country. So I've just finished this publication, but um, that's my first one. And I, I wrote that because I wanted people to see the holistic um, views and different yeah. lens. So thank you. Okay, let's go for the last one. Uh, so this is from Israel. Uh, thanks, Victor, for this great talk. You have mentioned several times that indigenous knowledge is about reading the landscape holistically, like a doctor reading unbalanced signs of sickness of, or mismanagement and trying to heal, look after, and care for this landscape. I'm very much interested, and me too, for sure, uh, in your idea of, uh, of your idea cultural of care. If you can expand a bit more what is exactly to care for about the landscape, it is different from the idea of care that more Winster or disconnect mindsets have, is care and share value between ancestral and more modern man's mindset. Yeah, I'm just trying to um, understand that question a bit more. Can you try and simplify? So, so, um, Sorry about that. It's 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 a little no no it is it, what I, what I think Israel is trying to ask you is is what are those key points okay what are what are those things that we need to focus on the landscape okay that will give us the sign that it's a sick landscape and what are those signs that you focus also that the ecosystem is saying hey I'm ready here to burn. Okay, because as I said before, the modern traditional or the modern prescribed burn idea, it's I'm under prescription, uh, humidity, mm, fuel conditions and wind conditions is under prescription, ready to burn. But we don't focus on those key points that you have said that the landscape is sending to you or messages that is sending to you. What are those messages? Well, the messages are based on everything and <laughs> and then, you know everything there's so many you know um and impossible for me to list them all but basically on you know um, the changing in soil qualities from leaf litter that shouldn't be in that country that's been rotting for 40 or 50 years and creating a composition of the soils and you know the fact that the trees have been all cut down the fact that the canopies have all been burnt from wildfires or even even have wildfires um the sparseness in grasses the the lack of um medicines and foods that um, that used to be there, that elders say that used to be there before, um, the, the decline in animals, um, you know, the invasive um, weeds and invasive grasses, um, the list goes on and on, you know. Yeah. The fact that you light a fire and there's no insects or nothing's going away, there's no life in the country when you, when you pull away the debris and there's, there's not even an ant on the ground. Um, you know, the lack of food, um, there's so much um, that tell us that landscapes are sick um, in every aspect and every way that um, we understand from plants, animals to soils to everything, the trees. Um, and when we see a diversity of country, and when we see country change as well, um, from a country that should be traditionally open and clear and um, have a r large range of plants that turn into um, just one type of tree that's taken over the whole landscape and, and a thickening of country or um, no grasses left on the country but just leaf litter because of the hot fires and what they've done to the country. You know, the list goes on and on and on. And, um, and for a lot of people, they don't know what country looked like because they don't have the knowledge of country. And one of the most important sources of knowledge in knowing what landscapes should look like through indigenous knowledge is is the knowledge of foods medicines plants and animals and so for example a, a food or a plant if i'm told to go get that food or plant i the first thing i do is look at the trees and find the right ecosystem the where that thing lives or that particular resource is and that's what the country is a diversity in maintaining diversity of ecosystems and when we lose the diversity of ecosystems, it's another indicator. And that's where fires go right across all different soil types and, and ecosystems because it has, it's all looks the same now because it's all leaf litter and well, it's all um, and a, a weed that's taken over the whole entire country and all the soils. And 
So we started to lose the identity of the landscape. And they, all those indicators showing us that it's sick country are also the indicators um, that help us to heal country as well when we start to see them reappear and the signs of healthy landscapes um, through those indicators. So there's a whole range yeah. that come with that. And I'm gonna show another background photo here. Um, like for example here, if I put this one up, Oh, it's not working here. Oh, yeah, it is. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's working. So for this picture here you see behind me, um, now, for example, hazard reduction would look at this country with just no fuel in it, with just a thin layer of leaves. Now, that has been caused from bad fires about 40 years ago um, that just torched that country. Um, and it was been sitting there with leaf litter and it has no life at all, no grasses, no food for animals. And when someone looks at that from a hazard reduction perspective, they go, oh, well, we're not going to burn that. There's no fuel. There's, um, it's not a hazard because there's not large amounts of fuel in it. We'll just leave it. But for us, it's no food in the landscapes and it's showing all the indicators of sick country. And so what those people are doing behind me are tediously burning all the leaf off the ground and doing the first steps to reactivate that landscape and to reactivate the seed banks and the country underneath. And um, uh, that is the first steps in reviving country and getting it healthy again. And that allows us to um, start to utilize the foods, medicines, and start to see the energy landscape return and reactivate the health of that country. Um, so there's a, an example there again, that we don't turn our backs on country um, when it looks like that, we want to fix it so that the animals and, and that there's food on the landscape. Okay. Hmm. So I think that's a great end, this photo that you just showed, it's a great, it explains a lot because as a firefighter for me, as you said, hey, why we should burn that because there's no fuel in it. But as you said, there's indicators for you that says that it's not a healthy ecosystem and we need to reintroduce fire just to improve that ecosystem it's not to reduce wildfire risk it's just to improve that ecosystem so I, I i i think this is a great finish for this webinar and as i said to the participants i'm, I'm really sorry we don't have more time for for more questions to victor but we will make sure that all the questions that you posted uh, on the platform it will uh, it will be sent to victor and we will make sure that those questions are answered and send it back to you okay Victor, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time being with us here. And thank you to all the participants from all over the world that has uh, joined us in this webinar. And this webinar will be, it's, it's being recorded and it will be posted on YouTube uh, in the next days. So if anyone has missed, uh, it, will be, it will be there in YouTube, okay? Victor, mm -hmm. thank you very much again, okay? Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Okay, thank you to everybody. Thank you to join us. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.